Hello everyone, I'm Cyacat Cosplay and welcome back to my channel. Today I'm going to be talking a bit about cosplay competition and giving you an overview and a run through of my last competitive build, which was Magda from Diablo 3. I have lots of bits and pieces of her to show you guys. Unfortunately, she doesn't sit on a mannequin very well. But I'm going to give you a nice close-up rundown of this costume and give you some tips and tricks if you have ever been interested in competing in cosplay, what that is, what that means, and how to put your best foot forward during a competition. Alright, let's go ahead and get into this video. So you may be wondering, what is competitive cosplay? Well, there's a couple of different types of cosplay competitions. There's a, something called a masquerade, uh, which is a competition that involves acting or some sort of skit or it, it, it's performative as well as craftsmanship. So masquerades are, or, or masquerade competitions or contests have a craftsmanship element to it sometimes, but is primarily focused on the performative element. That's not my area of expertise. My area of expertise is actually in craftsmanship competitions. So I'm not super into the acting or the portrayal or the, the performative aspect of cosplay. I'm interested in the craftsmanship. I am going to be talking to you today about craftsmanship contests, what they are and what to do to go into either your first or your second or your 500th craftsmanship contest. Well, if you're in your 500th, you're probably not watching this video. What is a costume competition and what is a costume that would be good in a competition? What is a competition level build? A craftsmanship contest is when you compete against other people to display your craftsmanship skills. It's competition against other people, but it is also a competition against yourself. So you're competing against yourself to make the best possible costume you've ever made, I hope. A competition level build, the definition is pretty vague and wide, but to me, a competition build is something that challenges you, your, your skill level, your comfort zone, you know, kind of makes you work. It's something that you push yourself on something that uses all of your skills, something that makes you learn new skills, something that you can feel comfortable having someone come this close to it and feel confident that it looks good. So there's no five foot rule here in competitive cosplay. Judges will and should get right up in your business. And so if you've made something and you don't want people looking at it too closely, that's probably not a competition level build. Everyone's competition level build is going to be a little bit of a different definition. If you're just starting out, your level of expertise is not going to be the same as someone who has 5 or 10 or 20 years of experience. It's going to be different for every different person and for different levels of competition and so Someone who is just starting out and wants to compete, their level of competition build is not going to look the same as someone like me who has more experience both judging and competing. That being said, if you're just starting out, you will get higher and higher and higher. You'll get more experience, you'll learn more things, you will eventually get there and then you'll be competing against me and I'll be like, oh no. So, you know, everybody starts somewhere. Something I get asked a lot is how do I choose a build and how do I choose a competition? I don't choose competitions based on cash prizes. That helps, but uh, I'm gonna get to this a little bit later. Prize money doesn't really cover a lot of expenses. It's nice, but it's not going to cover everything that you have to spend to compete. Uh, competing is not something that you do to make money. <laughs> if someone tells you that otherwise, um, yeah, I, I, uh, no. First, uh, you gotta figure out what competition you wanna enter. And it's not like, you know, you're just like, oh, I'm gonna go to this con in a month. Oh, I wanna compete. 
Usually I spend six to 12 months or more planning the competition that I want to enter, planning on what I want to make, time frame, budget. So it's a long process. So first off, figure out where you want to compete and give yourself enough time to feel comfortable completing the costume in that time frame. It's going to take you probably two to three times longer than you think it is to make the costume, so give yourself ample time. Usually I pick a contest based on my skill level and comfort level with that skill level. So I have competed in some very high level competitions. I've competed in the Crown Championship Circuit and at TwitchCon. Have I won anything? Well, yes and no. I've won and I've placed, oh well, I haven't won. I've placed at the Eastern Championships of Cosplay uh, back in 2016, but not placed in a high enough to get a cash prize. And at TwitchCon, I didn't place, but I got selected to go. So that's kind of placing, it's kind of, Anyway, I have never actually won a grand prize. And you know what, that's okay. I've competed and I've won prizes and I've placed, but I've never won the whole shebang. And it's actually really, really hard to win the whole shebang. Let me tell you from competing at TwitchCon, it's hard. It is competitive. Everybody brings their A game. So if you go to a competition and you don't win, don't feel bad because everybody there is bringing their A game. I pick a contest based on my skill level. And so maybe you're just starting out. So maybe you want to pick a smaller local con where you're not going up against people like Cowbutt Crunchies or Alta for Cosplay who are amazing and compete regularly and they just do all the things. They know how to do lots of things, holy crap. And so once you pick the competition, make sure to read the rules of the competition carefully to know what's allowed, what's not, how much of the costume you need to make yourself, how much can be bought, etc. Sometimes they don't post the rules for that particular year, but definitely find past competitions, past rules, and familiarize yourself with them because they're, they're not going to change too much year to year. Once you pick the competition, figure out if it's divided up based on skill level. So say the competition has a, an intermediate, advanced, beginner, children's group categories, or if it's divided up by skill set like needlework, FX, armor, larger than life. So figure out what the categories are and if you need to build to a category. So you want to highlight your best skill set and figure out what is going to fit that competition best and your skill set best. You're going to want to have a kind of list of costumes which you think might be good to enter into that competition. You want to figure out your strongest skill set and pick a costume that plays to your strengths. So when I decided I was going to enter TwitchCon, I picked Magda from Diablo 3 and in particular I picked her art book version which is very highly detailed. It's a big costume, it's a wide costume, it's detailed, it's complex, it has the opportunity to showcase all of my skills. So my strongest skill set is actually in the fact that I don't necessarily have a strongest skill set and that I'm pretty good at a lot of different things. So I wanted to make sure that I had a costume that could advertise that I'm really good at a lot of things. And Magda actually could have been submitted into any of the categories for TwitchCon, which actually kind of backfired on me a little bit and I'll get into that a little bit later. But I ended up submitting into the FX category because I mechanized Magda. I mechanized her moth wings. So that meant it fit into the FX category. You're gonna wanna plan your time and budget carefully. It costs a lot of money to make competitive cosplay. I'm not gonna sugarcoat it. Magda cost me well over $1,500 in materials alone. Ouch. You're gonna wanna make sure that you give yourself enough time as well. She took me over 460 hours to make that's working pretty much full time only on my costume for two and a half months straight. It takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of money to make competition level builds. 
there are costumes which you could make for a lot cheaper. There are competitive costumes that I've seen that have been made for only a couple hundred dollars and they look amazing, but you're probably going to need to put more time into those costumes to make them look good. At TwitchCon, in talking to the other competitors, I don't think there's anybody who actually spent less than a thousand dollars on materials alone for their costume. Most of the costumes cost in the range of a thousand to four thousand dollars in materials. And in the realm of time, they're ranging anywhere from at least 300 hours to a thousand plus hours. I'm sure that there was a couple costumes there that had almost 2,000 hours worth of time into them. So this is not something to be taken lightly. This is not something where you can be like, oh, I'm going to make a competition costume in a weekend. Time equals quality sometimes. Not all the time, but the more time you can put into a project, the better it's going to look. So make sure that you give yourself enough time and enough budget to execute your vision the way that you want it executed. There's nothing worse than having to take shortcuts or get a different material when you really, really wanted to make something out of, say, resin and you have to make it out of foam instead. And it, you, you're going you're gonna to feel worse about the costume overall if you, you know, don't do things the way that you wanted to. Not to say that you have to put a lot of money into competitive costumes, but from my experience, the more money that you can put into the costume, the more time you can put into it, the, the better it's going to look and the better it's going to do and the more proud you're going to be of it. I'm so proud of my Magda build. She's so hard to wear, it's so uncomfortable, but I look so great in it and I love it, and I just wish it wasn't so uncomfortable. As I mentioned before, competing in cosplay is not a money-making enterprise. To get to TwitchCon, I spent a lot of money on the materials of the costume itself. I spent a lot of money on travel, food, stuff while I was at in San Diego. So TwitchCon gives you a stipend for travel, which is awesome, and that covers a lot of expenses, but if you don't win, then I'm not even breaking even. And most competitions are not as generous in their prizes as TwitchCon is. In the Eastern Championships of Cosplay, their grand prize is $5,000 for the winner of the crown, which is the international competition. I believe they're upping the prize pool next year, or whenever the Eastern, or whenever the crowns happen again. It's probably 2022 at this point. Thanks, COVID. But it's not a money-making enterprise. There are some conventions where they have big cash prizes to draw people in, but the amount of money that you're gonna spend on hotels and transport and the costume itself, the prize money doesn't offset it. It's nice, but it doesn't offset it. So just keep that in mind, that, that competitive cosplay is not a money-making enterprise. You're not gonna make a ton of money off of competing in cosplay. It can be an awesome opportunity for you to showcase your skill set. It can be an awesome opportunity to meet awesome people. The, the people that I meet competing is what makes competing worthwhile. So when you're competing, generally you spend the whole day with your fellow competitors. Everybody else is nervous, everybody's worried, things are falling apart, everybody's tired and grouchy, uh, you've been in costume for eight hours. It's a very, <laughs> it's a bonding experience for sure. And the friendships that I've made from competing in cosplay well outweigh winning or not winning or any sort of money that you win or don't win from competing. So keep in mind why you're competing, what you're competing for. If you're competing to win and to win money, you're probably going to be not super happy if you don't win. When I went to TwitchCon, I didn't really care if I won or lost. It would be awesome to win, but I knew going into it that it's so competitive that the chances that I would win are pretty low. Um, so I went into it with fairly realistic expectations and I had an absolute blast. I had so much fun. I met so many cool people. I have a lot of new friends now because of it. So know why you're competing. I'm trying to show myself what I'm capable of and meet cool people along the way. So that makes competing for me a little bit more enjoyable. And I'm going to show you some progress 
photos of Magda along with this footage. I don't have a lot of video footage of Magda. I do have some of the wings and the, the movement that she does and the whole costume together and the movement of the costume um, with the wings moving. Most of what I have are still photos. She's pretty well documented because I was documenting for a competition. Unfortunately, like I said earlier, or did I say earlier? But anyway, unfortunately she does not go on the mannequin very well. So I'm gonna show you the pieces individually close up and kind of give you a rundown on how things were made and decisions that I made and what's in each piece and the time that went into all of this costume. Welcome to I put fabric down on my desk to make it look nice. All right, this is Magda's headpiece. So I'm gonna start from the top of the costume and work my way down and give you an up close and personal look at the various parts of the costume. This is the piece that goes on my head. It has a zipper in the back and the outside is the Yaya Han Ultra Preen, or I don't know, Yaya Han something fabric. Uh, I believe it's a pleather maybe or it's an Ultra Preen. It's stretchy um, and it's a pleather. So I wanted that look for the outside, but I didn't want that on the inside because I know pleathers are warm and this is going on my head and it probably is sweaty. So it's lined in black cotton and it has some wear and tear and makeup all over it. So please ignore that, but yeah. Anyway, the inside is lined. I'm gonna put up some progress photos of what this looks like in progress uh, along with this footage. But basically I made two giant pillows and it was real fun patterning this because I covered my head in cellophane and tape and then put that cellophane and tape pattern on a, I put that on a, a mannequin head and patterned this shape out of paper and tape and made a pattern that way. So this shape is actually four panels. It's two panels in the back and two panels in the front and then it's stuffed with fiber fill and it's actually it's silk dupioni and cotton and there's cotton uh, quilting batting in between the dupioni and the cotton so I quilted all of this I quilted all of this design onto the panels and then went in with a little bit of acrylic paint and a fabric medium and hand painted detail shading on all of the quilted panels. So it's kind of hard to see, but that detail is there. This zipper was stitched in by hand because it was a nightmare to put in by machine. So there's all these teeny tiny little running stitches, if it will focus, teeny tiny little running stitches between the two layers of the cowl. The front of the cowl has a silk dupioni band stitched into the front, which was a separate piece and pieced in on the front of the cowl before it was sewn down to the lining. This piece is a resin piece. So this was sculpted out of clay and then molded in silicone. Uh, it was molded in uh, Smooth On 65, uh, Smooth On Smoothcast 65D. So it's a semi-flexible re resin, and then painted with uh, acrylic paints. I believe it's mostly the uh, Plaid FX uh, folk art gold paints, weathered, a little bit of highlighting stuff. Anyway, this was put on with Cosbond, which is a film adhesive, and it's worked pretty well. Uh, I was worried about it on the pleather because pleather doesn't like glue but it's held up pretty nicely these pieces the the front of the horns these are foam so this is a piece of 10 millimeter tnt foam and then this is these pieces are thermoplastic that were roped over and that's pretty much it this was glued on with hot glue you have to be really careful when you glue on with hot glue so as not to let the glue show and i think i did a pretty good job Overall, this is really fun to wear, except I can't hear anything because I basically have giant pillows over my ears. All right, moving on down. This is the 
collar or neck corset. It is fully lined and it's lined in black cotton and uh, it's been in storage for a bit so the pleats on the back here aren't as nice as they were but it's boned with plastic bones I do have steel boning in the corset but I used plastic bones in the neck uh, for comfort I didn't want steel boning in the neck so this piece is actually four different layers and it's a bunch of different pieces so the way that I patterned it was with cellophane and tape and then I made a fabric mock-up and this is actually four layers of fabric well four layers the cotton is interfaced and then there's a layer of duck cloth and then the fashion layer of the silk du peony so the silk du peony is the major fashion fabric for this whole costume this pleating section this was pleated by hand and sewn in by hand so the pleats are sewn down with a whip stitch by hand uh, all of the bias tape on the costume was all sewn on by hand in with a blind stitch so you can't see the stitching and it's blind stitched on on both the front and the back you can kind of see the stitching if you get really up close in there you can kind of see it on the edge there but um yeah mitered corners and blind stitching that's all over the costume so when you're making a competition level build keep in mind that they're going to be looking at your stuff up close and sometimes giving that little bit of extra time and effort to do things by hand really helps bring the level of the costume up a notch this is actually one of the first pieces that i that i made and completed there's a little bit of uh satin stitching on the collar as a little bit of a detail but i didn't really satin stitch anything else on the costume I did it on the collar and then decided I didn't really care for the satin stitching. Um, I ended up doing all the rest of the embroidery on the costume by hand. So this closes with just a couple hooks and eyes. You can see the satin, satin stitching. I did it through the, the inner layers. There's a little bit of wear and tear and makeup and it's been in storage, but overall still happy with it. Closes in the front. It looks real nice. You can barely see the, 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 these guys from the, the front and they're actually two separate pieces so that they separate in the back just those tiny little details that only I notice this is the bodysuit for Magda it's not a corset it's actually a bunny suit it's kind of hard to get all in camera here but anyway so you see bunny suit this beast is fully lined fully boned it's boned with both straight and spiral steel and it fully laces up the back. This was kind of my epic piece de resistance. I have only ever made one other bunny suit and it wasn't my best work. So I had to basically challenge myself to say, I'm gonna make a bunny suit and make it really well. So I used the Yaya Han uh, bunny suit pattern. It's McCall's pattern. I forget what pattern number it is. As a base, I made a mock-up of that pattern and then altered the pattern. I had to alter it for sizing and also for the fact that there's multiple color panels on the costume. And then I made the suit out of lining in cotton so you can see the inside is cotton the cotton was interfaced and then there's a layer of duck cloth inside here and then the fashion layer and everything was was flat lined which means that the fashion fabric was stitched onto the duck canvas around the edges around the seam allowance and then everything was put together um, and the whole thing is grommeted with metal grommets. Looking back, I kind of wish I had done these grommets by hand, but live and learn. And this was actually the first costume I've ever put grommets in. So go me. 
The, the steel bones, uh, the straight steels are on the front and the back. The spirals are on the side. And then these panels, the panels with the beading on them were actually made separately. And the same with this front panel, this was made separately and then hand stitched onto the costume with a blind stitch. Like the, all of the bias tape for this costume, this was stitched on the same method. And, uh, there's so much bias tape in this costume, holy crap. Uh, I'm pretty sure I made over 30 yards of gold silk bias tape for this costume. Get yourself a bias tape maker. Please, please get yourself a bias tape maker. Anyway, this uh, embroidery was done all by hand. It was, it, it, it kind of looks like gold work because of how much it sticks up off the um, fabric, but it's just gold embroidery thread. The silk, basically, I took a layer of silk and a layer of cotton to back the silk and put it on an embroidery hoop and went to town. This panel here took 32 hours to fully embroider. These beaded panels, uh, these are all um, tube bead. I don't know the real term for these kinds of beads. These are all beaded on by hand. There's a little bit of an embroidery um, line to kind of mark where um, the beads go. Uh, the beading motif I came up with on my own. Um, the same with the uh, these designs here. It was kind of just made up. Um, there are some details in the art that you can kind of see what they these patterns would look like, but um, I just made them up on my own. And uh, like like all bunny suits, it has crotch snaps. So uh, pro tip: getting in and out of costume and going to the bathroom so much easier with crotch snaps. And then this little uh, moon up here that is uh, Thebra. This moon shape up here, that is Thebra that has been primed and smoothed and sanded and painted again with uh, acrylic paint. Now we come to my moth sons. These are my mothy bodies. Mothy boys, um, everybody wanted to pet these when I, when I wear the costume. They are my pride and joy. They are modular. So this costume was designed to go across the country and it needed to be able to fit in my suitcase. So if you notice, Mothy Boy here is hollow. And that's because he's designed to break down and the uh, harness that harnesses all of his electronics get inserted into the body when he's assembled. So the head and the skull section are connected to the thorax and then the butt is actually a separate piece. It's basically a pillow. I have moth pillows. Um, this is just basically a faux fur pillow. Um, I made a uh, tape and paper pattern and then made, made butt pillows. It has a little strap that it hooks onto the body with. Um, it actually hooks onto the um, shoulder apparatus, the, that harness part, um, not the actual body itself. So this guy, he's made of foam, faux fur, and the face is resin. So this is actually something that I sculpted, molded, and casted because I needed two of them and I needed two identical ones. So I sculpted this out of monster clay and I'm not the best sculptor, but I'm really super proud of what it looks like. And it's not super smooth, but that's okay because this costume, you know, is kind of creepy and it's organic and it, it worked for the costume. So this, like the headpiece, is was molded in silicone and then cast out of Smoothcast 65D and then painted with acrylic paints and the plaid FX color shift paints. So you can see he's got a, like a pearlescent purple sheen to him. He's really pretty. I'm super happy with the paint job. And then the back of the head, he's basically again, a, just a pillow. He's stuffed and sewn on and glued on. And the, the eyes and the nose are actually, if you can see up real close, that's actually still do peony in there, so it's the the eyes and the nose are are covered over with silk do peony. 
just one of those little tiny details. And uh, when I was being judged at TwitchCon, there's little holes through the back for where the wings poke out, and um, Vulpin Props was trying to like see into the holes to see the mechanics, but the fur hides it. So there's little holes here for the wing mechanics to pop out, and everything is modular, so I'll show you how that all works in a little bit here. And then last but not least, his little leggies. These are made out of uh, 10 millimeter foam that was primed and sanded and painted and glued together. And there's a little strap here that hooks them around my arm. And then these straps in here hook onto the inner apparatus. So he, his body's made out of foam on the inside and then the fur was glued on. And I just hot glued that fur on because hot glue works real well with fur and uh, fur hides a lot of mistakes. Wing. This is one of the wings for the moths. And there's a little tiny hole at the tip here. And the wing swing arm inserts into the hole. And then there's a channel along the top of the wing here that allows the swing arm to be in the wing. So the wings actually can pop off and on pretty easily. And what these are made out of is uh, faux fur, suede, and the inside is actually an iron-on interfacing foam. So you, it's a double-sided iron-on foam, so you can iron the fabric directly onto the foam. And then I went and quilted the basic wing design in and then hand-painted with acrylic paints. So this is some of that plaid color shift paint. Actually, um, this is looks gold, but it's actually uh, black with pigment in it. So that was really interesting to paint with. And yeah, it's they're they're sewn together at the the corner here, or is it glue? No, yeah, it's, it's sewn together. I can't remember. I made this costume a while ago. And actually, this is the second version of the wings. Originally, they were going to be all fur. And it turned out that they were too heavy. So I had to um, make some changes, make them lighter, take a lot of that fur off. Uh, and then there's only just fur at the front end of the... All right. These look messy. And yes, they are. But these are the swing arms for the wings for Magda. So the wings use servo motors and the servo motors are separate from these swing arms. I could have permanently attached the swing arms to the servos, but I knew this thing had to travel, so I need to be able to break it down. As ugly as this is, it works. What I did was I took uh, coat hangers and cut them up and actually used Thebra to attach them to is this this rod is actually a little bit of a different size than the rod that actually inserts into the um, aluminum coupling. This is you can get plastic couplings for servos, but I need something a little bit heftier. So this is actually an aluminum um, an aluminum coupling for the servo swing arm, and then this is basically a tiny tie rod, and that's inserted into the coupling permanently with Fibra, you'd be surprised what thermoplastic can do. And this thing actually has two tiny little screws that you uh, screw in and tighten down onto the servo head. So the servo gear head, this screws in and tightens on and the wings weigh approximately 11 ounces. So you can't really support more than a pound on these servos with such a long swing arm. So this is over 18 inches long. You gotta make sure that your servo, what it's moving, it can move. The servos that I have are powerful enough to move this just fine, but um, because it's so long, it I had to be careful of of weight and it turns out that the original was too heavy and so thus I had to redesign the wings. So these are the four swing arms for these servos. Welcome to the brains of the operation. This is the inner wing harness. This is why the costume is so uncomfortable. 
because the entire weight of the moths is situated on my shoulders. So to maintain the illusion of the moths just a floating or lightly alighting on my shoulders, this is the entire harness system. It has a point of contact around my arm. This band is actually made out of Silk Du Peony because I'm extra and made this out of Silk Du Peony. And it's got Velcro sewn on and then it's lovingly hot glued the crap out of it onto the warbler. Actually, the inside of this is cotton canvas. So it's got some structure. It's not just Du Peony. But the inner structure of the wing harness apparatus is Warbla. This is Warbla over foam, over two millimeter foam. And these things only connect by a strap that goes around the back of the neck. And this strap actually gets hidden by the collar. And then the electronics connect through this um, connector. And this is du Peony, a Dupioni cover for the electronics and they do come apart. So this also hides and helps uh, cover my skin from damage from this, this connector between these, the uh, left and right shoulders. So electronics were new to me for this project. I decided to challenge myself and make a mechanized costume for the first time for TwitchCon. And uh, I needed a lot of help. I had a lot of help from my dad who helped me um, with putting a lot of stuff together and also my friend Aaron Lunger who helped me with the programming and uh, fixed my really, really, really um, amateurly put together battery situation and helped out a lot in figuring out weight distribution and just kind of overall um, rescued me from uh, probably certain failure and taught me a lot and um, I'm really super grateful to both my dad and him for helping me figure all of this stuff out. So the batteries aren't in here right now but there is a loop here for a battery that goes to the board and there are loops over here for batteries that go to the servos. So the servos are powered by two four double A packs of batteries. And the board is powered by a lithium ion. Basically it's a, you know, like a power bank for a cell phone. That's what powers the board. So I have two servos in either shoulder. Unfortunately, these are slightly broken at the moment because they've traveled across the United States twice. On their trip to BlizzCon, they got a little messed up but I do have footage of them working and I'll insert that here. So there's a switch to turn the servos on and another switch which is detached at the moment but there's another switch that uh, goes into the board that is a switch to turn the servos basically from off mode to on mode and there's two on modes. There's a mode where they flap together and a mode where they flap separately. And so this is an Arduino Mega board with a servo shield on top. So you can see that's the Arduino Mega. Um, the reason I have an Arduino Mega is because my dad gave it to me. He had an extra Mega hanging out, so he basically just said, here, have it, and shipped it to me. I bought the uh, servo shield. So the servo shield allows me to control the servos from the Mega a lot more easily than if I was wiring the servos directly into the Mega. I did solder all of the connectors myself, go me. So the, the servo shield does not come pre-soldered. Well, it does and doesn't. So you have to solder certain things on. You have to solder certain pins in, certain connectors in. 
And so I did that all myself. I, I did mess it up occasionally, but I did it all myself. And I did a lot of the wiring and everything. Um, Aaron, when he helped me fix the batteries, did some um, last minute soldering to solder some things to the batteries and etc. But everything else I did myself, all the wiring and setup and figuring out where the servos go and what needs to happen. So the servos originally came off these aluminum mounting brackets and the aluminum mounting brackets are just mounted into a butt ton of Thebra or Warbla and they're screwed right into the Warbla and then reinforced the crap out of that with more Warbla. So these aluminum mounting brackets don't go anywhere. They are firmly ensconced in the shoulder itself. Originally, the servos came off the mounting brackets, but I have since thread locked these on so that they wouldn't come off. And I'm pretty sure it's this servo, which is broken. So the rest of the servos don't fire. And I can't get this off right now unless I really go at it and probably strip the screws and mess up the mounting bracket. But I don't need her to move now that she's done competing. So uh, unless I decide to take this costume back out and compete it again, I don't need to fix this right now uh, or replace the servo. But this is how the costume moves. It's how it works and the major FX parts of the costume. Now you may be thinking, this isn't a lot of FX, but putting this together, engineering this, figuring this all out, took me literally weeks. Um, the programming, figuring all that out, getting that fixed and done and everything, it took me a very long time. And uh, mechanical stuff has a definite, very high learning curve and Every single mechanics uh, project is different. So what works for one costume is not going to work for another costume. So if you have questions about servos and wing mechanics and wing mounting, in general I can answer questions, but specifics for this costume are specific only to Magda and to her programming needs and to what she needed for, for this to work. So. I would direct you to the Adafruit website, which the, the Servo Shield is from, and a lot of online tutorials about wings because what worked for this costume is not going to necessarily work for another costume. So this is probably one of my most favoritest pieces of the costume. It's the gloves. Uh, mostly because I love claws, and it's so much fun to wear claws. The gloves are just a spandex glove, and these are Warbla over foam, and you can kind of see on the inside here where the Warbla is creased over the foam. Then these were primed and sanded, so they're really, really nice and shiny, really nice, smooth surface. There was a lot of sanding on this costume. And then they are super glued into the fabric. I'm going to make a video on how I glue armor onto gloves in the not too distant future, so I will show you how I actually glue those on, so stay tuned for that. And then the spandex is just sewn on to a upper silk part. The silk is cut on the bias so that it has a bit of stretch, but um, be wary when you make gloves from non-stretched fabric that you're going to need an expansion at the wrist. So there's actually an opening at the wrist to allow my hand through, and then it closes with a hook and eye. And the silk on these is, um, there's nothing backing it, so the edges of the silk are um, overlocked to prevent fraying. And then the top was sewn on. And, uh, you know, this is actually, I think, the only piece of bias tape that wasn't sewn on by hand. 
This is the dagger that is decorative that sits on her abdomen. I guess it's a dagger. I don't know what it really is, but uh, this is made entirely out of foam and foam clay and it's flat on the back so that it just velcros onto the costume. It suffered a bit of damage during travel, um, so you can see it's creased here and had a little bit of an accident with the tip here. But uh, overall, it's held up pretty well. It still looks pretty good, unless I'm right up in your face with the damage. It's, uh, you, you, you're not gonna notice. Uh, so this is made out of uh, SKS uh, high density foam and foam clay. Sanded, primed, painted with acrylics and uh, the silver on this is actually rub and buff. All right, this is one of the arm pieces. Originally I wanted to make it out of foam to make it lighter, but uh, it didn't look quite right. So this is actually from a plastic. This is Thebra over an interior warbler arm piece. So this is actually, this is foam and then there's warbler over the foam and you can see here that the warbler is just lipped over. So this was a base for me to put all the petals on. The petals are two layers of zebra and then they have been primed, sanded, primed, sanded, primed, sanded, and then painted. And then the uh, straps are made out of silk du peony to match the gloves and hot glued on. I use a lot of hot glue for attachments because as long as you don't see it, it looks fine. And hot glue works really, really well and I haven't had to fix any of the uh, attachments, reattach anything. So if it works, it works. Okay, so it's going to be really hard to show all of the skirts on camera. Um, but this is probably one of the most time intensive parts of the costume, which was doing all of the beadwork and all of the embroidery on the hip panels of the skirt. So these hip panels are beaded, embroidered, and more beading and more embroidering. And these are actually, um, basically I took bias tape and stuff fiber fill in there and closed it by hand. They are machine stitched on one side and then hand stitched on the other. And these swag pieces are also hand embroidered and hand beaded and they took way too long. I think all together, all of this beading and embroidering and putting together, including this front panel, took two whole full weeks and these panels are attached onto the skirts. These skirts actually have two layers, this inner layer of gray, which is fully French seamed, so there's no raw seams whatsoever on this inner gray layer. The gray layer is a single layer, and then the purple, the purple layer is actually a double layer. And again, with the bias tape, it's all hand stitched on. When I originally took photos of the costume, I machined the bias tape on, then took the machine stitching out and put hand stitching all around the edges. I took two days to hand stitch all of the bias tape down with tiny little blind stitches. Worth it though. So all of these skirts were self, um, this is backed with a uh, cream silk that I had left over from something else because I ran out of gold silk. I had to use so much of the gold to make so much bias tape that um, by the end I was running low. So the uh, these are backed with um, satin instead of du peony and it's actually hand um, tacked to the satin so that it's not puffy and sits right. Same with this. This is all hand tacked to the satin. Yeah, this was a lot of, of time and very time intensive. Worth it! All right, last but not least are the stockings. These were uh, kind of a, a 
pain in the butt to engineer. And actually these are the second version. Um, the first version, which I competed in, actually had, um, I made basically shoes out of the stockings and I had toes, but uh, for wearing it at Katsukon and wearing it at um, BlizzCon, I wore sh actual shoes with the costume instead of the the toe shoes um, for comfort and because I was going to be walking around in this costume rather than just standing around and competing. So these are made out of uh, silk and they are backed with um, black satin. They are grommeted and these details here, these are all foam. They are partially hot glued and partially cos bonded on to the silk. These are all made separately. There is one other foot piece that is separate from this. But these are all foam and thermoplastic and elastic. So these went around the ankles. They're separate. They elastic on to my leg. I almost forgot about my hand armor. So this is one of the other pieces that I made out of resin. And I covered the entire back with felt so that it's nice and clean. That's a pro tip. If the back of a piece of armor is nasty and has lots of weird stuff and glue, just cover it in felt. It'll cover all your sins. And then I've got a piece of elastic that goes like that. And I made these out of resin because I needed two identical hand armor pieces. So I wanted them to be the same. So to make them the same, I made this out of monster clay. I, I basically took a piece of warbla and foam and fo formed it into the shape that I wanted and then sculpted over that form with monster clay and then mold and casted this piece. So this is one of my favorite. I think the hand armor is honestly one of my favorite things of a lot of costumes. So it's really super light and it looks the same on both hands. It's a little, it changes a little bit just because of the angle of the elastic, but uh, it's, it's the same thing for both hands. So that's Magda in a nutshell. I hope this close-up rundown of the costume and a little bit of discussion on competitions was helpful. If you like this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up, hit that subscribe button, and if you have any more questions about this costume or competing in cosplay, leave a comment down below and I will see you guys in the next video.